This week on Arizona Illustrated, we revisit a traditional Chinese celebration of the Lunar New Year. We celebrate Thanksgiving, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate New Year's, and then we celebrate Chinese New Year's. Spin with the stretchies. All right, shall we roll it? Woo! Stretching, relaxing, and cuddling your way to better mental health with goat yoga. You can do as much goat yoga a more yoga or more goats, depending on what you're in the mood for today. Goat at your own pace. And the steep cliffs and peaceful waters of Sabino Canyon. Just the sound of it when we started walking up to it was enough to draw us in. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara, and we're here at Tucson's beloved Reed Park, home, of course, to the Reed Park Zoo. There's High Corbett Field, home of the Arizona Wildcat baseball team, and the Randolph Del Uric Golf Course. And along with all those attractions, there's about 150 acres where you can come here to stroll and walk your dog, or as in our case, find a little bit of shade. In our first story now, we're going to show you some things that you may never have seen, or at least haven't seen in a while, like loquats, a lion dance, and people wearing coats. You see, back in February, we spent the day at Mission Garden. The Garden and the Tucson Chinese Cultural Center teamed up to allow Arizonans a chance to experience the sights and sound and foods in celebration of the Lunar New Year. My name is Faye Tom, and we're at the Mission Garden in Tucson, at the base of A Mountain. We're celebrating the Lunar New Year with the Tucson Chinese Cultural Center and the Mission Garden. The Chinese New Year is based on the moon, the Lunar New Year, so that's why it's called Lunar New Year. And uh, it goes uh, from f uh, new moon to the full moon, and this whole occasion is just to get people uh, to understand how to be healthy and wealthy and, and how to promote the growing of their crops and be prosperous doing, doing that. So as, uh, you know, a Chinese American, we celebrate Thanksgiving, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate New Year's, and then we celebrate Chinese New Year's. By the time you get to Chinese New Year, it's like, you know, a little bit worn out from the other but it's still something that we practice. And I think there's probably just as many cultures and uh, celebrate the Lunar New Year as they do the, uh, the uh, Solar New Year. We, as Chinese, came here uh, in about the 1880s with the building of the railroad. And some people stayed, and then they started to farm in, in this area. They would take these uh, vegetables that they, they grew and sell it to the uh, uh, people that were in this area. Mission Gardens is an agricultural history museum. What we have done is um, gathered the seeds from the early Chinese families that reflect the vegetables that they would have grown. So a lot of these came from China and have been handed down through the generations um, of the Chinese families here. So my great-great-grandfather came over um, to work in Mexico, in the farms in Mexico, when they had the Exclusion Act. The Chinese weren't allowed in Arizona, but so Mexico kind of picked up on that, and they had a lot of the Chinese go down into Mexico to do the farming for them down there. I used to, with my grandmother, we would grow the bok choy, and then we'd actually blanch it, and then hang it up on the clothesline with clothespins and, draw, and let it dry, and the bok choy will keep for years uh, preserved, and it makes a wonderful soup. 
almost every Chinese family that had a grocery store or even a restaurant or a laundry, if they had a little patch of land available in their backyard, they would grow vegetables. My grandmother grew vegetables and we had the different kinds of fruit trees of things that um, were originally from China. be able to do this in one sitting. It takes them two weeks just to spin the damn thing. And, and well, because it's Chinese New Year's or it's Lunar New Year, one of the, the, the couple fruits that a lot of people use and will have available, and that's the pomelo, which is a large grapefruit, and that kind of signifies family unity. Um, we, we, they have oranges, tangerines, and those kind of represent wealth. They're kind of like gold and they're round. So almost, you know, all these things that, for, that are associated with Lunar New Year typically are pretty auspicious kinds of symbols and representations. A, uh, a little loquat tree that we planted in the Chinese garden today with the Lu family uh, to honor our uh, ancestors. Uh, you honor, you know, the, those the people that have passed, but you also honor your future, you know, uh, family. That when you're gone, you still ha able to produce and have some fruit for for them. So there's the lion dance that's coming pretty soon. In Cantonese, it's gong hei fa choi. People will say the same thing back to you. And usually you, you hold your hand like, like this. So you're both wishing each other uh, health and wealth. What does it take to be a professional female endurance athlete? Well, it takes time, training, and self-care, all of which require funds that are hard to come by when you spend most of your time training. Well, there's an organization here in Tucson providing housing, support, and mentorship to elite female athletes, such as cyclists, allowing them to thrive. This is the Homestretch Foundation. There's nothing more that I like than riding my bike and racing, and I love the adrenaline, and <laughs> yeah, I like to fly down mountains. Being here really gives me a chance to just focus really hard on getting high quality training. Sometimes you don't want to train, it's hard, like you don't feel as good as you want to. Um, it's hard to train, it's hard to race. Um, also, it's kind of an unsure career, like, what am I gonna do after? Um, will I get there? Will I be able to win money with my bike racing? So being here, being like with other girls that feels the same thing, it makes you feel like you, you belong somewhere. Everyone has their own goals, but they also like genuinely wanna see you reach your goals. I got a flat, there's a lot of thorns here in Tucson, so it's a pretty prevalent occurrence. 
I think it's good for everyone to know how to fix their own flats because when you're training, sometimes you have to go alone and it's good to be self-reliant, self-sufficient. I love doing my tempo intervals up lemon because it's just such a steady gradient. You can really just get in the zone um, and listen to your music and hammer it out. And then the better you do your interval, the more you get to descend. So <laughs> it's rewarding. The Homestretch Foundation came into being when I was a pro cyclist and I was really struggling to make ends meet. I'd made it to the world tour level. And had I been a man at the world tour level, I would have had a minimum base salary. But the women were deemed, quote unquote, not to deserve one. And that made no sense to me. And I remember thinking, we need to fight this. And at the same time, I was like, if I'm at this level and there is no minimum base salary, then I, I might have to quit this sport. You know, but I wouldn't have to if I were a man at this level. So that was difficult for me to, you know, to handle. When we started Homestretch Foundation, you know, the base salary for men was about 35,000 euro, which is roughly equivalent to 40K US dollars. I saw women leave the sport because they couldn't make ends meet. Athletes can apply for a two to six month residency and for them being able to live here and not have to pay rent and utilities is huge when their paychecks are that small that it makes a big difference. I'm a waitress so I just stand up for 12 hours straight. So on my bike after, even if, if I don't feel it, I know that I have less energy to train. So being here, so I have more energy to focus in my training really struggled back home with resting <laughs> enough because uh, I worked part-time job and if I wasn't working then I was I was cycling so um, it's been really nice to be able to to rest properly and stretch and it just keeps all of the niggles um, and injuries prevented. By 2023, the women of the World Tour will have the same base salary of the men at the pro continental level of professional cycling, which is the minor league equivalent to the major league of the World Tour. We will still have to continue to fight and say, no, it's not enough that we just have the same base salary as the pro continental men. We need the same salary as the World Tour men. We're seeing change happen, but we still have to continue to lobby for this inclusion. Being a woman in cycling, gender equality is like pretty much all you think about. I feel like the gender equality um, fight is moving, but moving slowly. I'm not sure if it's gonna be fully equal when I end my career, but there's big steps that are being made. This is the medal that I won in Tokyo. On the side here, you can see it says rowing and women's pair. It's very heavy. <laughs> Previous to cycling, I rode. When the pandemic hit, we couldn't train in boats. I bought my first carbon road bike, and then that was primarily what I did for most of my training. And then I guess I just fell in love with cycling to the point that I was like, okay, like I could see myself switching over once the Tokyo Olympics were done. Welcome to the home stretch. Spin with the stretchies. We encourage you to ride next to someone you don't know. And that's one of our things for our, our athletes. We'll find their way next to someone they have not yet met. And it's a nice, easy, chill chat ride. All right, shall we roll it? Yeah, sure. Woo!
All right. On Fridays, we have an event called Spin with the Stretchies. The Stretchies being the nickname for the home stretch athletes. Term of endearment. So on Fridays, we have a ride that leaves from La Buzz on Tanque Verde. And it just lasts for an hour. It's 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And we go out at a very slow pace, you know, tops 15 miles an hour. And we ride, you know, so athletes can talk to members of our Tucson community who might not be professional bike racers, but they just want to get to know, you know, what's it like being at home stretch? And, you know, what's it like being an Olympian? What's it like being an aspiring pro? Well, that was fun riding with you. Yeah, it was really today. nice. No problem. Well, have a good rest of your ride. Yeah, you too. You <laughs> Thank too. you. Nice to meet you. Nice yeah. Good. You, you're racing too? Yeah. I'll come watch. Oh, perfect. Okay. Cool. I think we have time to grab coffee before yeah. we leave. Community group ride that's open to anybody that wants to come out and join us. And it's pretty awesome to see the connections and the kindness that comes from that. Together we're <laughs> So far, we've been able to help 75 athletes from 17 different countries, and we've just started our sixth year, and you know we're, we're growing, and it's a beautiful thing to see how this effect has helped so many. For more information about the Homestretch Foundation and its mission, visit homestretchfoundation.org. We've all been through a lot these past several years, so anything we can do to relieve stress and support our physical and emotional well-being is welcome. You know, a lot of people turn to yoga, and some who do find it even more restorative when, while they're stretching and relaxing, they're being massaged by tiny little goat hooves. You see, Emily Haddon raises dwarf goats for therapy, and she and her goats can help you to stretch and cuddle and relax with goat yoga. When COVID came out, we took a six month break and then we've been back now and kind of getting in full swing. Ground here is so rock hard, it does not like me. My personal experience is what brought me to this. Um, I grew up with a lot of health issues growing up. I have an immune deficiency, so I actually have to have infusions done every other week, um, very time consuming. And so it's been really nice to have the animals to keep me motivated and I've done horse therapy in the past and the reason why I started goat yoga is actually my best friend she tried to convince me for about two years and I was like you're crazy I don't even have goats she's like you really need to look into it and I was like okay and I had no idea how much I would love it sharing the animals and people that don't have access to animals can just come to my class and spend an hour with them and go home happy this is a very beginner friendly class don't choose today to do the splits for the first time. We want you guys to have a fun experience and be able to walk out of here. So I'm gonna go get the goats and I will be right back. The goats are very intelligent. They can be really challenging. I make a joke and I say it's like herding cats. Good morning, welcome. We're gonna start. You can do as much goat yoga, uh, more yoga or more goats, depending on what you're in the mood for today. Goat at your own pace. Breathe in through your nose, a nice full inhale. And exhale out your nose, nice and slow. They've done a scientific study where goats recognize a smile. So it's kind of like an interaction that just keeps building and building. And, and, and I don't know if you noticed during the class, it kind of starts out quiet. And as it goes along, people are getting more and more excited. The goats are getting more excited. You can see them running around. And everybody kind of feeds off that positive energy. When they don't have goat yoga during COVID, it was really hard. When we brought them back, they were almost too excited because they were wanting to jump on them, that they were like, they didn't care where they were standing. It was on the top of the head or the face or whatever. And as you can see, they're pretty careful. So they were pretty desperate to be interacting with people. They really enjoy it. They definitely have a pecking order. There's like a boss goat and they were headbutting. That's them just challenging who gets to be the boss for the day. And then they kind of have the lowest goat on the totem pole, so to speak. And that one will kind of be the last goat that gets to choose which people to jump on. While the goats that are the bosses get the prime choice of who they want to stand on first. 
I mean, for most people, I don't know if they have as much patience as I have. I was fortunate enough to have help today, but Gertie sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Gertie likes to escape. She'll just be like out of the fence, out of the fence, out of the fence, and she'll lift it up for everybody else, and they'll all be out of the fence, you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're all out of the fence, I'm in the fence, how's this gonna, you know? And I'm like trying to like be professional, <laughs> you know? Like, And plus some people don't like the serious side of, of some types of yoga, and some people are all about the serious side of, of yoga, so it's fun to have something different. Oh, the funniest story I have is the goats make a fart sound. So sometimes when they see a dog, it's one of their alert sounds and they'll like use their lip and it'll be like a fart sound. And it literally sounded like somebody in the class farted. And it was so funny. I was like, excuse you, don't worry, that was the goat. And then everybody was laughing. That's pretty funny when that happens. <laughs> Boyfriends get drug along with their girlfriends. This is my favorite. And they're kind of irritated and they're like, we're going to goat yoga. And yeah, and they get drug along and they're just, not real excited about it, and pretty soon I, I see them and they're starting to have just as much fun, if not more, than their girlfriend next to them. All right, here we go. Ready? To be honest, I was probably a little like apprehensive or intimidated. I don't know, like I've never done a yoga class before. This is my first one. And uh, yeah, it was nice. Well, it was fun to just be silly, you know, like on a Saturday morning, it surprised him. He was like, I don't know. And then it ended up being really fun. And center. And then we're gonna open out to the diagonals and center and knee and elbow touch. I think that the instructor is amazing too. And the people who are the goat wranglers over there, they did a good job keeping them inside. And I feel like when you're done with yoga, sometimes you're, you feel relaxed and you need to go eat and drink water. But right now I feel like I'm gonna go do Sabino Canyon. <laughs> And it's funny, sometimes there'll be people lined up. They're having almost as much fun as the people in the class. Or they'll drive by and they'll just like, you're like, I hope they don't hit anything as they're driving by. They're all rubbernecking as they go past us. We probably caused a couple accidents. Maybe you could tell a story about the one goat that got away, remember? Yeah. What happened? He jumped over and he get in the car, buddy. <laughs> I'm really want to make my farm available to do personal tours or personal time at the farm to spend time with the animals, whether it's sitting in a park bench next to the horses, watching them eat, reading a book, enjoying your coffee. I also want to start some homestead type workshops, making goats soak, canning things. I also offer goat -a so if you know somebody is having a hard time, especially now that we have baby goats, I'll dress up one or two baby goats and come in somebody's workplace and cheer them up for 20 minutes with baby goats. We're lucky to have a place that we can rent at the moment and we're really happy there, but eventually we would like to purchase a place. But it's hard to compete with people that are coming in and paying cash for these properties. And it's really hard to get loans. So when you go into the bank and you're like, I have a goat yoga business, I'm pretty sure they probably laugh at me, I don't know. <laughs> but maybe there's somebody out there that would have land that they would want to sell to somebody like us that, you know, it's myself and my daughter and we run this uh, goat yoga business to try to push animal therapy to people and share it with others. May you be happy, healthy, full of peace and love always. Namaste. Yay, goat yoga. For more information about goat yoga classes, visit goatsoftucsonyoga.org. It's one of the first places we take our visitors to Southern Arizona, a place that we rediscover with awe from time to time, a place of wonder and water and wildlife, Sabino Canyon. I come to Sabino Canyon area because it's just one of the nicest places, I think, in the United States. I was visiting Tucson since the late 80s where I have a, an aunt who's passed away, but I would come every winter and she lived just about a mile from here. And I'd walk here almost every day and do the Seven Falls and just go up the trail and it's just, there's so many different 
spots with so many different kinds of, of terrain and environment. And uh, it's so peaceful. It's just a remarkable, remarkable place. We live in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and we love Tucson because it's a beautiful area. So we're always trying to explore and find new places in Tucson. And then we discovered the trail. It said to go out to the dam, and here we are, and it is spectacular. I have been coming here since I was literally like before out the womb, my dad used to always take us when we were little. And so I just always came here. And so like now that I know the trail by myself, I can take myself. So it's kind of nice. <laughs> but I always love this place. I like how it's just always love the water. I think everybody should check this place out. It's worth the experience coming out of anywhere than Arizona. And it's something different for sure. And I will remember this moment with you guys and with her. It's a 10 out of 10 experience. This is my boyfriend, <laughs> and uh, he lives in California, and I just always told him about hiking and, like, always wanted to take him here. So now he's here, he's with me, so I took him. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff, a lot of trails to go to, a lot of people, always in a good mood, and just a lot of stuff to, like, look at and everything. It's a really good experience. Pretty cool, something we don't have out there, and it's a really good, it's really different. We do have the Rio Grande, but I'm sorry to say that it spends a large portion of the year actually dry. So we're south uh, of where the control of the water flow is up in northern New Mexico, so we don't really get a lot of water down there. So this is a great pleasure to see this flowing water. It was just the sound of it when we started walking up to it was enough to draw us in. It's just such a unique environment, and the Sonoran Desert is just so beautiful. There's something so powerful about the saguaro cactus that you just don't see anywhere else. In the Midwest or something, you've got lots of trees, and you can't see the distances here. It's just you can just see forever. Birds and, and uh, of course, the many different species of cactus. And the people are very friendly here, too. I should mention that. I've never met unfriendly people here, so. Another reason I keep coming back. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara, and we'll see you next week.